what's unique about North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota has the lowest unemployment rate in the country, and you know, North Dakota is much different than Washington, admittedly. There's only about 600,000 people in the entire state. We're at about over 6 million here in Washington State. Uh, but that being said, we do depend, you know, it's generally stated that small businesses are the economic engines for the economy. They provide about 75% of all the jobs that are out there. And when small businesses can't operate or grow or run their businesses because credit is cut, uh, the Bank of North Dakota has been one of those things that really keeps their economy chugging along by providing access to small businesses and farmers. Uh, I had mentioned the, the fact that it has one of the healthiest banking systems in the United States. It's the only state in the country with a budget surplus. So some detractors will say that uh, that's because North Dakota has extensive oil and gas revenues. And it is true that North Dakota is doing very well uh, through their oil and gas revenues because they discovered oil in this oil, uh, Bakken oil field, which stretches not just from North Dakota, but also a majority of that oil field is in Montana and Wyoming. So I think it's interesting that Montana and Wyoming don't seem to be um, generating as much revenue. So with, with, and as a matter of fact, the Bank of North Dakota actually, over the last 10 years, has provided more revenue to the state general fund than the oil field revenues have. So the fact that uh, North Dakota, North Dakota has its own bank, is the one common factor between all of the different firsts that it has. Another interesting thing that North Dakota is first in is that it has the lowest default rate in the country on student loans. So they have, uh, they picked up the slack when student lending um, was in a crunch and were able to provide that service to students. But the federal governments generally recognized that that was a problem throughout the country. So the federal government now has as centralized student lending. So North Dakota uh, modified their lending program. They call it the Dakota Educational Loan Opportunity, something I can't remember what it stands for. But they have modified their student lending program now, so it's supplemental to what you can get uh, from the federal government program because it costs a lot more just to go to school than just to pay the tuition of books. So they provide low subsidized low lending for our students in that way as well. <clears throat> so this is, a, as great concepts happen to do, this is catching fire all around the country. So this is a good list of the states that are looking at creating their own banks right now. The one that has gone the farthest is California, Assembly Bill 750, which last summer they passed it through their legislature and got a bill which is very similar to our House Bill 2040 to create a task force to looking, looking at creating what they call the California Investment Trust, coincidentally. It was modeled after our bill, actually. It passed through the legislature and they got it to Jerry Brown's desk. He declined to sign it, but he didn't veto it. He just, with the message, he sent it, that bill back to the legislature saying, he ran on a campaign not to create any new task forces, so just create this thing if you want me to do it. Don't send me a task force to do it. So the, the bill is back at the legislature right now. Hopefully California will be moving forward on this soon too. Hawaii um, passed a bill. Uh, I know their chair of their finance committee, Marcus Oshiro, and he was championing a similar task force bill to our House Bill 2040 as well. They got it passed out of the House, uh, but it stalled in the Senate. Uh, federal government, oh, President Obama talked about creating an infrastructure bank in his jobs bill. Unfortunately, the Republicans would not let that jobs bill get a hearing in the House. So that concept is dying at the federal level. But if you even look around the world, most developing countries are able to develop because they have their own public banks. And some of the strongest economies in the world have a true public banking system. You look at Germany, for instance. They've got uh, 140 different public banks scattered around the country, including municipalities. So um, Japan, Brazil, India, China, they all have their own publicly owned banks that finance their development.
there's a Center for State Innovation did a white paper study on what a bank could do for Washington State. So based on data collected from North Dakota, uh, and you know, there's really no model on how to predict anything in the future. So this is all just very rough guesstimates, but this is what a bank could do according to the Center for State Innovation in their white paper. If we were to invest $100 million into capitalizing the Washington Investment Trust, they say it would return a positive by year three. Uh, and by year five you, and down to year four, you can see that that $100 million investment, original investment, could parlay itself to $743 million. <coughs> if we scale that up, say we invested a billion instead of $100 million, that's, what does that work out? $7 billion, $430 million that we could build the Washington Investment Trust into. And guess how much work and how many jobs that could create in our state. Oh, this is really interesting. <coughs> when I was looking into, I went back to Bismarck, North Dakota, to visit the Bank of North Dakota and talk with the president and get a sense of how they operate. And in, in North Dakota, uh, Bismarck is also the capital, so they have an archives there. And it's interesting, the history, the Bank of North Dakota developed out of a bill in 1919 from the Nonpartisan League, the NPL, who back then people felt like the Democrats and the Republicans were both controlled by outside <laughs> interests. <laughs> the banks in Minneapolis and Wall Street. So they rebelled and, and elected what they called the Nonpartisan League representatives who had this reform agenda. One of the agendas was they want to create their own bank. The other one was they want to create their own uh, grain mill and silo operation because Minneapolis was strangling the farmers. They were extorting them basically for their ability to mill the grain and, and transport it. So they wanted more local control. So when they were trying to pitch their program to the people of North Dakota, they were actually using Seattle as a model. So this was a front page article on the, off the the nonpartisan leader newspaper, and they were saying, America's best example of public ownership and successful operation, they were looking at the Port of Seattle because farmers here in the Puget Sound area were facing the same problems. They could not transport their grains off the piers because the shippers were charging exorbitant rates. Uh, so they created their own public infrastructure to, to do that. Um, this may look familiar to you. This, this was, um, a publicly owned uh, grain, whatever you call it, oh, elevator. Oh, okay. And the bottom catch is probably the only publicly owned and operated grain elevator in the United States. This, this was them selling to North Dakotans how you can do public infrastructure rights. So we taught them how to do this back in the day. So now it's coming around full circle and they're teaching us how to do it correctly in a banking system. In North Dakota, they have a prohibition of corporate farming and corporate ownership of farmland. Uh, invest in Washington, not Wall Street. But our interest, so this is to the narrowed down version of what we're trying to do with House Bill 2434 and Senate Bill 6310, their companion bills. Um, work the multiplier effect of keeping money in state. You know, if we're creating infrastructure jobs. I can't remember what the multiplier is, but it's something like seven, seven times. If, if we are funding jobs within Washington, construction jobs, those construction jobs create jobs to the lumber and materials providers and to the restaurant owners and everybody else. So you're multiplying the effect when we spend our own money within our own communities. Um, I talked about the deal program in North Dakota. Uh, it generates revenue for the state because when we are funding infrastructure, construction pays sales tax on all of that money. Um, this program is constitutional, so we're staying clearly within the constitutional bounds um, and creates a resource for our grandchildren, which I think is the most important goal. I went through this slide. 
So we got a, the task force had a presentation from the uh, Office of the State Treasurer, their cash management team. So this slide comes from their cash management team's uh, explanation of how cash flows through the general fund. So what we're talking about is right now, if, if we have our general fund, which is about $32 billion, but the total cash flows, if you count everything that goes in and out, it's about $290 billion uh, a year. So what we're talking about is this amount. This is the cash flow. You can see how. But you can see that there is a core amount that goes to just under $2 billion that's always in there. It never goes below that amount. So if we were to transfer our general fund, which has hundreds of separate accounts within it, the treasurer manages all these hundreds of separate accounts. If we could move that into an infrastructure bank, yes, we would have this cash flow on a daily basis, but there is always a core amount that remains within the bank. I should call, I gotta remember not to call it the Washington Investment Trust. Okay, I don't want to be misleading about anything. The speaker is very clear that we are creating the Washington Investment Trust, not a state bank. 